My name is uh, Mohan Kalkunte. I'm the VP of Architecture and Technology in the Core Switching Group at uh, Broadcom. Uh, I've been with Broadcom for a long time, so I'm a broad, long term uh, Broadcom employee. So today I want to talk about the Ethernet fabric, the Broadcom solutions, all for AI. And uh, before I um, before I speak further, I, I want to let you know that this is a result of the work of many hundreds of engineers at Broadcom. So today, I'm here representing all the hard work that the engineers at Broadcom have done. So you all know about the cloud. The cloud has hosted many uh, traditional applications. Uh, one of the emerging applications is, of course, AI. Everybody knows about it. And um, if you look at uh, you know, AI as an emerging application, the, the requirements of these uh, AI application is, you know, it's one, one, for one, it is very complex, and, and it's exponentially large in terms of the requirements. Now, if you look at some of the examples here that I've shown here in terms of the large language models, these models are pretty huge. So for instance, you look at uh, GPT-3 as a, as a large language model. You know, it has about 175 billion parameters. Uh, GPT-4 from OpenAI is rumored to be about a trillion plus uh, parameters. And likewise, you have models from, you know, like Google and Llama. So all of these are huge models. They're so big that you have to distribute them, which is what's happening in the traditional uh, di uh, distributed computing world. Now, <clears throat> now CPU was good enough for uh, traditional computing, but um, and, you know GPUs are all, are what has been used for uh, you know AI, AI processing here, and you need lots and lots of these GPUs that have to be interconnected and they have to work as one computer. So in other words, networking becomes a very key element because you need uh, thousands of these GPU clusters. You have very large data set that you need to train across these multiple GPUs and there needs to be communication among all these GPUs. So the networking becomes a very critical piece in fact, the network itself is a computer. In fact, uh, you know, Sun Microsystem long time ago coined this term called network is the computer. So what makes uh, AI networking unique? Um, if you look at a uh, training model, right, you have, the, um, you have the compute phase, you have the communication phase, and you have the synchronization phase. So in an AI training, uh, I guess most, most of the people are aware, uh, you're training uh, in a deep learning uh, model, you're training a very large uh, uh, neural network, and you have, to, you have to train so that you can uh, estimate what the gradients or the parameters or the weights are. And that's what happens during the compute phase. Now, because the model is so big and you are distributed that over hundreds of GPUs, you have to, and no one GPU has the complete model or the complete data set, during the training phase, you have to exchange all these gradients or parameters, so that's the communication phase. And these gradients are average, and then all of, when, when all the weights have been exchanged, then you need to synchronize so that the model parameters are updated, and then you iterate again. So this process kind of iterates, compute, communicate, and synchronize. You iterate over and over again, until you get the desired level, until the model converges and you get the desired level of accuracy. Now, if you look at what does this mean for the traffic on the network, right? First of all, you have fewer flows. Um, unlike the traditional computing application where you, ha where you have millions of flows, you have few flows. Few flows means uh, less entropy. And these are high bandwidth flows, uh, you know, by the nature because of the amount of data that they need to exchange. Uh, these flows, they all pretty much start at the same time. So you do the compute, all the GPUs do, does the compute, then they all start uh, exchanging uh, traffic. So, so they are somewhat synchronized, 
and they are bursty in nature. And because they burst at uh, such high rate, the links get saturated in a pretty short order of time. Uh, the, the AI training jobs, they take a long time to run. So we hear, uh, for instance, in some of the GPT-3 models on the older uh, GPUs, they take about anywhere from 20 to 30 days. Maybe with the newer GPUs, they take a lot less time, but nevertheless, these training jobs, they take a long period of time. And one of the key metrics for this AI training is what's called as the job completion time, how fast you can complete the job completion. Now, that is impacted by what's called as the tail latency. Because you are exchanging all of the data between all these uh, different GPU nodes, the, the, the last flow is the one that dictates how fast you can move to the next iteration or the next uh, training cycle. So that is tail latency, and minimizing tail latency, you know, you minimize the job completion time. So if you look, as, a, as I mentioned before, right, um, networking is a key element. So this here's a chart that uh, presented by uh, Alexis at the OCP Global Summit that shows where the time is spent in networking. So this was for their recommendation models or, or, or what's called as DLRM models. And what this one shows is for their various benchmark models, it shows the amount of time that was spent in networking. So for instance, uh, in one of their models, they say it's north of 50% was spent in networking. What that means is that that's the amount of time the compute is waiting for the network to deliver the data. So the longer it takes, or the longer the network is in the way, right, uh, your, your training performance is impacted. So what, are, what could be some of the reasons for um, this happening in the network? So the first one is transient oversubscription, although this is less of an issue in the AI network. In the traditional networking uh, world for the traditional computing applications, this is true, you will have oversubscribed network. But in the case of AI ML network, uh, this is not much of an issue. But nevertheless, they could be, you know, if you get your traffic patterns uh, wrong or the core is somewhat oversubscribed, you could result in some kind of an over, uh, uh, oversubscription on the sending side. The main issue that we see is flow collisions and link failures. So if you are doing ECMP as a load balancing, right? So the traditional ECMP it is a static load balancing. You can have uh, two or more flows mapping to the same link. So that causes, uh, you know, uh, oversubscription on that link and therefore you it might result in packet loss. So this is one of the biggest issues that we see in, in uh, you know, for AI networking flow collisions, like with the traditional ECMP. The other thing also is the link failures. Um, because these training jobs, uh, you know, they, uh, the performance of that is deeply impacted by link failures. So this is something that we have to, to see how to take care of that. And the last one here is, uh, what we call as in-cast. In, for instance, with certain communication patterns, like all-to-all -all communication patterns, you have many GPUs sending traffic to one GPU, right? And that can result in what's called as an in-cast. If the traffic is not controlled, you will result in in-cast. And no matter how much packet buffer you have, you might still lose packets. And that, again, impacts the performance of uh, you know, uh, a training job. So how do we improve this? So for instance, with uh, for uh, like I mentioned, the transient or subscription, which is not a whole lot of an issue, but still, you know, depending on the type of uh, network and the type of uh, uh, how how well it is provisioned, you can still have something like network telemetry from from the network that can signal back to the sending source uh, when to throttle down and how fast to ramp up. So that's one way to improve it. The second one is for the flow collisions, um, packet spraying, right? So you have the network, you have multiple paths through the network. How effectively can you use all of these links? 
And one of the techniques that is being used is packet spraying. So you take a flow, you spray the packets within that flow across all the uh, different links, and you do some kind of receiver ordering. That receiver ordering can happen at the top of rack on the destination side, or it can happen at the endpoint itself. Or alternatively, you know, uh, if you still want to do some kind of ECMP, we can do what's called as cognitive routing, which is a load aware ECMP. So in this case, before you pin a path to a particular link, you look at the load of that link. Now, uh, if that load is too high, then what you do is you say, okay, let me select an alternate member of that set so that I go on a least loaded link. So this way, this also minimizes the low collision within the network and therefore increases the performance. Now, link failure. When, when you have a, a very large network, uh, you, know, you will always have some link failures. Now, the question is, uh, does the performance degrade linearly or how fast do you recover from these link failures? And this link failure should happen in hardware. And that's what we mean by zero impact failover. So the loss is minimal, but you read out the packets quickly in hardware. You don't wait for software to intervene and say how to read out the packets. And lastly, for the in-cast problem that I mentioned, uh, the best way, to, the, the best place to handle is on the receiver side. The receiver has complete knowledge of all the traffic that it is getting in. So what it can do is it can pace the senders uh, appropriately. So if you have 10 senders sending to one receiver, the receiver can send credits to each of those senders so that the sender can pace uh, the, the traffic to, to that particular receiver. And this uh, credit control mechanism, either you can implement at the top of the rack or at the end point itself. So either of those is possible depending on the type of implementation. As we've been talking to various customers, right, typically most of the cloud customers, they are multi-tenant. So there's a front-end network and then there's a back-end network. Front-end network is where you have your traditional compute applications. Backend network is where you do your AI training. Um, as we see um, that, you know, uh, cloud cloud companies they want to support multiple tenants, even for uh, AI. AI as a service for each tenant. So, so we see that multi-tenancy is also needed for the backend networks. And what this means is that you need to have a consistent set of tools across the network. Uh, you need to have some kind of consistent telemetry across these networks. How do you root cause a network? What is the SLA mechanism that you have? How do you virtualize the same kind of virtualization mechanism, whether it is a front-end network or the back-end network? So in fact, what we see is that the requirements for both the front-end network and the back-end network, they are converging. And not only that, we also see that over time, the infrastructure will also convert. So you have one network where you run both the front-end applications as well as the back-end applications. In fact, we have some customers that are already doing this. So having talked about uh, networking being the key element, having talked about the issues, having talked about some of the uh, things that needs to be done, uh, we want to introduce two solutions here. Um, one is the, these we call as the schedule fabric solutions. So on the left side, we have uh, a network based on Jericho 3 AI. So Jericho 3 AI is our uh, uh, device that we announced earlier this year. And on the right side, it's based on uh, Tomahawk 5, which is a high bandwidth device. So on the left side, it is, I call it what's called as uh, uh, switch uh, scheduled here. So in this case, um, you know, it's all Ethernet, right? You connect via Ethernet to the GPU. So you have a NIC, and that NIC could be either a Broadcom NIC, or it could be a customer NIC, or a merchant silicon NIC, or it could be the GPUs themselves might have native Ethernet interface coming out of it. So that is what you connect via Ethernet to this top of the rack. The traffic comes in, you know, and the receiver, the destination switch will send credits to the sending switch. And when the sending switch has the credits to send it to the destination switch, 
It takes the packets in, it breaks it up into cells, spreads it across the, the Ramon fabric, which is the spine here. The cells and the packets are reordered and then sent it back to the destination GPU. Okay. And Henry Wu will talk more about this solution in the next presentation. Uh, the other one we call it as endpoint uh, schedule. So this is where the intelligence resides on in the endpoint. So like I mentioned, the endpoint can be any one of those. And Tomahawk 5 is a high bandwidth, high radix switch, uh, but you still need to have uh, things like load balancing or telemetry and how best you can convey that telemetry information back to the uh, endpoint and so on. And uh, Pete Del Vecchio will talk more in details about this Tomahawk fabric. Quick question on that. Yeah. Basically what you're doing is introducing net new silicon for being able to do the switch scheduling or is that different from Tomahawk side? So this, yes, we have this, this is where the scheduling happens at the switch. That is the Jericho 3 AI. And you don't need anything at the end, at the end unit at all in order to take advantage of this. Correct. So you, it is like for where you don't have uh, good capability in the endpoint. This, you know, pretty much solves the problem. And I'll show you later on how the how it compares to an alternate technology. And then on the endpoint schedule, everyone has to have that capability built into the actual endpoint. Correct. Right? Yes. No. But you still need to have a fabric of high bandwidth, high radix, and the load balancing mechanisms. And Is there any mix between the two at all? Or you guys, like, build one or build one fabric that's switch scheduled, build another one that's endpoint scheduled? You can't really... It depends on the customer. Sometimes they try to mix it, but our recommendation is, you know, keep it all, uh, you know, switch scheduled because, uh, and then there it is like endpoint scheduled. Okay. Yes.